So welcome, Adam. I'll hand you over now to Harry and Adam. Thank you very much, Charlotte. Pleasure to have you here, Adam. Good to see you. Hope you're doing well. Thank you, Harry. Uh, yeah, it's good to be here. All right. So for anyone that's not <laughs> aware of what you are and what you do, could you just give us a quick intro introduction as to what your job is and how you describe yourself? What is it that you do? Yeah, so uh, I'm a producer, director um, and director of the company. Uh, I'm an editor. I'm a shooter. I take the bins out. I do all of those things and that's I guess that's because you know when it's it's quite a small production company so there's eight freelancers and there's sort of three to four very often on and off full-time people so we kind of have to do a bit of everything if you know what I mean um yeah and so what we do is we produce from we do like uh, ideas creations uh, we produce uh, content for broadcast and content for marketing, social media, that side of things. So we do like kind of campaigns, really, for companies big and small. So we've been, you know, lucky enough to work with companies like Sony or Cisco. Um, but then we'll very much work with a one man band company, a smaller company. Um, but yeah, one thing that we are quite passionate about is um, kind of companies that are you know, for, for companies that are doing good in the world, um, moving things in the right way, and also getting young people uh, into the industry that maybe wouldn't normally otherwise have such a, an easy route into the industry. So people from underrepresented backgrounds, um, people with learning disabilities, people, any, a whole range of people that, you know, wouldn't otherwise normally be able to get in. That's something we're really keen to get on with. Um, and yeah, the sort of stuff we do is basically live action, so shooting stuff, it's corporate things, it's music videos, but then there's another side of us uh, work, which is our own creative stuff, um, which we've been kind of, we have a slate of stuff that we're making at the moment, and animation, uh, which we had to learn to do in lockdown and remote filming. Uh, yeah, so it's a lot to talk about. I, I, I'll let everyone breathe, sorry. <laughs> yeah, that's quite, it's quite broad. You've got your finger in a lot of pies there, it seems. Well, tell us a bit about how you ended up doing what it is that you do, how you got in your position. Uh, so all these companies. Yeah. So what, what the, I'll start with. Um, so I lived in a tiny village uh, and there was one bus a day into town. And uh, yeah, and everyone knew everyone, which is lovely. But also there wasn't much. Uh, so I wanted to be an actor uh, and I sort of ended, did a H&D, did a BTEC. And I was like, ended up having to get out of where I lived because there just wasn't any kind of opportunity. So, um, yeah, so I, I trained as an actor, did that and managed to get um, a degree. And I mean, my family, uh, so we, we were we're very poor. I'm from a quite poor family. Um, um, and so basically, yeah, um, my mum wasn't able to sort of support us in, but she was amazing. But she wasn't able to like, if we fell on our ass for money, she wouldn't be able to like kind of, you know, help us out as, as much as she'd like to. So all the way through kind of working in different jobs, but um, I ended up in London, uh, well, Harrow, sort of north of London. And um, I realised that kind of acting, I was more interested in being behind the camera. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so I, it, I was started to do work experience, uh, kind of signed up to lots of different websites, and some of which are still there now, believe it or not, when I was that young, there was the internet still. Um, but yeah, yeah, so, but, but some of the websites are, are still there and some are really useful. And I, I can go into the details of those and would recommend, so certain places I would definitely recommend doing work experience. Um, yeah, and I kind of worked for free for about four years whilst working at Pizza Hut, pulling pints. I was terrible at all of those things, um, but yeah. Um, yeah, so I was working for free and then suddenly I got a break in a kit room. So I was cleaning cameras, uh, I was loading a van up in, in London and they were going out on shoots and stuff. And then I think someone rang in sick. Uh, so they let me kind of step up and I got paid. I think my first pay was about 120 quid for a day, uh, just kind of production assisting. So running, getting cups of tea, um, doing all of that sort of stuff, basically. Um, and yeah, it took me four years to get 
a first paid job and I was like, is it even worth it? Amount of times I was like, yeah, I don't think, um, don't think this is right for me. But then over the next 10 years, I was really lucky because I managed to, the person that ran that company, we got on really well and they recommended me to other people. And with them, we kind of ended up working at BBC, Disney, ITV, a few other places. And then from running, I worked my way up to like uh, doing some associate producing. Uh-huh. So, um, which was really good, really, really good. Um, but I ended up in a niche, which I really hated. So, uh, yeah, I, I, there's a theme, Harry, to everything I'm talking about. And that is that I've made lots of mistakes and um, uh, always, yeah. And so I guess it's quite a good one to listen to so that people don't fall into those same areas. But I kind of found myself getting bottlenecked into American reality TV. Uh, which I'm, I'm not proud of. Um, and it was two celebrities. I think Tony Braxton's sister was going out with Lady Gaga's manager. And they, so we followed them around all of these places like the Dorchester, the Savoy, all of these places all over London. And, and essentially it's like the only way is Essex or Chelsea or whatever the thing's called, where they, they just construct arguments. The director is trying to get them to argue um, all the time. Uh, to make drama, conflict, whatever. Um, and it was, and we'd have the paparazzi flying around trying to catch, but it was just like every day, it just left a bad taste in my mouth and I wanted to get out of it. And uh, finally we were on the London Eye. Is it called London Eye? Yeah, London Eye. Yeah. We we're just going around and what we just got in the door and I'd got a light. Um, the director mentioned something that he wasn't contractually allowed to mention between the couple. Um, so they weren't talking. And the sound lady kicked the cameraman because they've been working together for six months, 15 hour days, and they just were hated each other. Um, and so we just, so the guys wouldn't, refu- they refused to talk. So we just sat for 50 minutes going around, just being really awkward and absolute silence. It was like a Vicky Gervais moment times 10, you know, really awkward. Uh, and at that point I thought, I don't want to do this anymore. So I quit and uh, thought I want to move by the sea and do something a bit more meaningful. So that's when we kind of set up the egg, big egg. And yeah, that's the kind of origins of it really. Um, but there were so many mistakes. It. Yeah, yeah. well, yeah, I mean, I guess a lot of it is, I think for me, I'm a bit of a slow, I have to learn by, I don't often know what I want to do, but I've learned by realizing what I don't want to do anymore. Does that mm-hmm. make sense? Yeah, so, would you say that's a typical sort of journey for someone in your position? Because you mentioned four years before your first paid gig. Do you think that's what people should expect to have to try, try, keep turning up? And then eventually you get, hopefully, in a position where you are, where you do what you want to do. Yeah, it's an interesting one because I think everyone has different stories. I mean, I was taken under the wing of someone and they kind of helped me in. So the guy that was running the company that I worked for, he kind of, he was just really lovely and help me out loads and I'm forever thankful for that because the amount of times I was so close to just quitting it and doing something else um so yeah is that is it typical I think there's two there's two ways that lots of my friends have kind of broke in one is like like me they were fortunate enough to meet some kind of mentor that kind of liked them and got on with them and you know and then the other one is that um that their peer group at university or their peer group at college or their peer group of friends, one of them gets to a certain level and takes them along with them, if that makes sense. So that they're the kind of two, two routes. But I mean, I, the biggest thing for me was I, I was quite shy and not very good at, um, or didn't really understand the importance of talking to people and just kind of networking. And, you know, I thought, oh, I've got a degree, that's fine. And I'm a massive advocate for education because it certainly helped me when I didn't know what I wanted to do. And it, it also teaches you life skills, doesn't it? You've got to be someone on time you're accountable for. And the idea that I was getting into debt at the same time was like, right, OK, this is serious because I can't get bailed out. Like, mm-hmm. um, but, uh, but yeah, so that helped me. Um, but, but they didn't, when I got there, the guy, they didn't care that I'd done a degree in form and arts wasn't interested obviously I'm not going to act my way out of anything so um you know uh, so but but what 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 was good was that I was ready to listen and I was really keen and um I genuinely wanted to just have this real thirst to learn 
Um, but yeah, in terms of in terms of roots, I think it's about sowing as many seeds as you can, really, I guess, because a few other things. So one of my contemporaries at university now runs quite a successful dance company. So we do a lot of work with them to very kindly asks us back regularly. Um, so there's a few bits like that. And then there's a few other contacts. But I think one other thing that I did do quite well was as soon as I did another job, I'd email all of those people and go, oh, just to let you know, I've updated my CV. Just found a reason to annoy, not annoy people, to contact people regularly, if you know what I mean. And that worked really well, uh, well for me. Um, but then now there's so many more established uh, routes that I've seen. So like train traineeships, is that the right word? Traineeships, uh, apprenticeships that actually are being ran in a really good way. I think there's so much, the industry has got so much further to go in terms of relying on free labor. And that's mm -hmm. always been the way. It's pretty embarrassing, you know, um, and we try our best not to do that here as much as possible, you know, um, but but the industry is, is built on that, on that idea that, you know, and especially in Hollywood, when you see PAs in the same role for 10 years, you know, it's just disgusting. So there's not many industries like that, which actually function on that idea of free labour. So there's that balance, I think, and maybe we'll talk to it in a bit, but when do you say no to stuff? When is mm -hmm. stuff not right to do? You know, when is that carrot sort of just never going to get close to you? Do you know what I mean? Um, and people do manipulate that because everyone's keen. Everyone wants to get there. So, um, but yeah, that's something I've had to learn as well. When to say, when is it right to do a free job and when is it not right to do it? And I still get that wrong every now and then, even now. But um, but yeah, so, so many routes, routes to get there, I think. But I think the, the key thing is don't burn any bridges. You know, try everything and, um, you know, so the seeds everywhere really so um, it is it is about who you know not to be I, cliche but you, that seems to be the recurring theme here i think so i i think also you've got to be keen though and i think uh i think you've got to be the right fit and the other thing as well is that i know people always say this but uh you've got to be nice to be around <laughs> as much as because you know you're doing a 15 hour shoot uh, and um, if you're just annoying or if you're, I know it sounds harsh, but, you know, it is worth being aware of that because there could be two people, someone go same skill set, but someone's just nice to be around or, you know, um, yeah, it's obvious, isn't it really? But, um, but yeah, I do think who, you know, and I do think now if I was a bit more braver, would have been more doing, looking at more networking groups, more things like that. It's just, it's never going to do any harm and it will stick in someone's mind. Do you know what I mean? And also finding stuff that maybe, so say you want to get into filmmaking, you're not going to, you know, you maybe won't get straight into a runner or researcher role. It might be that you do social media for a company for a bit, or there's like a little bit of a comparison journey that would work, uh, you know, to get you, get you in, in their thoughts really. Um, but yeah, so I did, I did running. That was one way in. I also did logging. So um, I think her name is Katie Piper, an uh, amazing presenter who had acid thrown on her face. There was a documentary about it. Mm -hmm. um, and so we did the logging for that. And that means 10 hours just sat there. Um, uh, yeah, every time something happens in the rushes, you just write it down. Katie's mum opens the door at 404.24, you know, and that is a rite of passage. But I think for me as well, in terms of choosing when to work for free, look at the output that that company's doing. So look at the stuff they're making. And if that excites you, then that's probably worth pursuing. Do you know what I mean? Um, so, so think about that as well. But I'm jumping around a bit. I'm sorry. No, that's fine. That's fine. Well, to put sort of a face, if you will, to all the work you've done. We've got a little showreel here and we can see some of the things you've talked about, including the reality show, I, I presume. Oh, uh, no, that's not in there. No, this is, is Big A. Yeah, that was, uh, yeah. That's yeah, in the past, my hands on that now. Yeah, of course. Yeah, it yeah, comes back in nightmares, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, valuable lessons you learned from that, I hope. But yeah, so this should be more focused on stuff you're proud of. Yeah. So, yeah, we'll run that. We'll, we'll see, give a, a bit of an idea of what it is that you've done. And then we'll circle back to yeah, some of those points that we were talking about.
quite a lot to fit in there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we probably need to chill that out a little bit. It's, <laughs> it's a bit full on, isn't it? Yeah, quite energetic. <laughs> yeah, so if anyone wants to see that again and just look at more about Adam's work, obviously, bigeggfilms.com, uh, you, can, you can find that and uh, work your way through that little showreel. Uh, I figured before we talk about the importance of networking and turning down, you know, knowing when to say yes and no to jobs, just quickly look back in in the past and and just talk about what influenced you as as a young person growing up to sort of make the choices you made, and as well a bit talk about your pathway and how you ended up where you are because you mentioned being an actor, so. Yeah, talk about a bit of your influences and uh, sort of let us know how how that helped being uh, le learning about acting and how that was able to sort of help you take that leap and, and go behind the scenes rather than in front of them. Yeah, I guess um, if I'm honest, I wasn't very good at school um, and I used to mess around a lot and I only did drama because I thought it was an easy option. Um, and and the teacher we had was just phenomenal. Uh, it's so cliche, but like she was just like, yeah, incredible. Uh, and that made me just think, oh, actually, I really am interested in this. And um, uh, and, and something I chose as a joke, really, um, just turned into like a passion, really. And just the idea that you can kind of make someone like uh, just escapism. I love it. Mm -hmm. I love the idea that you can just do an idea with something that's in someone's head someone else can feel can cry about or someone else can and that that whole idea that that, that that you have that agency and or someone's had a really horrible lived experience can 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 process that through their art and someone else could learn from that or you know see an, a different point of view um and and then I guess like kind of influences as well um just like comedy like I was always obsessed with like Rick Mail um Bottom the young ones, those kind of things, yeah. uh, probably going over everyone's head over everyone's head now. But um, yeah. uh, and like Shane, like Shane Meadows as well, like this is Englandy stuff, and just the gritty like kind of uh, documentary filmmaking. I'm intrinsically nosy, and I love it now because I get that bit of me tickled when I ask people questions. Uh, Ninety percent of my work in life is me interviewing people, so uh, you know. Werner Herzog and, and Louis Farouk, like real inspirations. And just, I could sit in, sit in my little village in the middle of Dorset, in the middle of nowhere, and just be taken across the world and learning how everyone else is so different, but yet quite similar as well. Do you know what I mean? I, I, love, yeah. I love that. I think that's really important. So, um, uh, and how, yeah, so then acting, I guess, does, did really influence my work because it's just that idea that, it, I, I just love the idea it didn't cost anything as well like it's, so, it's something that doesn't cost anything I mean camera yeah but even now on your phone like you can there's film festivals shot on phones isn't there but um so the idea that it was accessible when it was just in your head and um yeah I don't know so co comedy documentary were real themes that kept coming through for me um and yeah with the acting stuff as well I, I wasn't a very good actor uh, uh although I loved it um and I think that's helped me be able to give direction uh, and know the bits that were what I did that was cringy and, mm -hmm. and realize that, you know, why was that? Uh, yeah, I don't know. I kind of, I think because it was in me that was like that, that's easier to communicate. And I know what I'm asking someone to do in a way, a little bit easier. Yeah. Um, You're able yeah. to compensate for the areas where you kind of lacked, you knew what needed to be done. Yeah, absolutely, Harry. And I think what's also born out of that is that other people were better at different things. And that's something that's been a real learning curve for me. Um, certainly with Big Egg, um, like my theory now is just to surround myself with people who are better than me. Mm -hmm. And uh, and that's that's kind of carried forward, really. So someone's better, you know, there's a director who'd be much better at this. I don't need to be if Big Egg is about me, then it's dead in the water. It needs to be everyone understanding it buying into it and uh it needs to exist without me do you know what i mean and and it needs to be better because it's not just me uh, i think the idea is that you have to hold on and control everything and that's what i was like and i don't think i, I think with a film work particularly it's such a collaborative experience you have mm -hmm. to be able to trust people like 
you know, that's the art form and they're killing that. They're all over that. I know, I, you know, you don't need to micromanage. And I think, yeah, I learned that a lot from, from my own inabilities to be able to do certain roles, you know? So people's brains don't work, always work like that, you know? So I think that's all right to accept that and then think about, well, what am I good at? What do I bring to a team and stuff? But, um, but yeah, influence wise, very eclectic. Um, and also sort of, uh, sort of uh, Japanese uh, animation stuff as well, just randomly. So that's always been something I've never been able to replicate that. But yeah, uh, just other worlds, I think, inspired okay. me really. Um, well, that's, that's, a, that's a good transition talking about how you need to collaborate and find people that bring out the best in you. So is that what happened with you when you were learning to be a director? Because that's one of the questions we got in the chat. How did you make that transition? How did you sort of put, in, put it into effect going from the actor? Um, so what was the question? How did you learn? To How do you it? learn? Yeah. How did yeah. you make that transition? Uh, well, I guess, first of all, imposter syndrome, I've got that hugely. I always think someone's going to knock at the door and go, what are you doing in it? Like, yeah, uh, and that's sort of in me all the time. But I guess, uh, so yeah, so the move actually was, the move, I think I kind of managed to watch uh, I study people like I really do watch other directors and having sort of well at that point when I started Big Egg it was 11 years experience just kind of watching directors work and knowing the sorts of sets that I liked being on and knowing the sets that I didn't like being on and thinking about why that might be as well um, you know this idea that you've got to come in and go bah, 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 you know that that's just it's a you know I can't stress enough it's teamwork um, and there's ways of doing things and you can argue, you can disagree with someone, but in a, in a nice way, it doesn't have to be uh, confrontational. And actually, if there's any confrontational uh, on the set, the whole vibe changes anyway. And, you know, if you're asking an actor to be vulnerable, for example, they're less likely to be able to do a performance like that if there's just a bad vibe about everything, you know. Um, so, yeah, I guess carefully watching how people do things, knowing when you've got to shut up, um, and giving someone time to kind of uh, explore an idea. I think listening uh, to podcasts as well. Uh, I've learned so much from listening to podcasts, like filmmaking podcasts. And, uh, Do you have any uh, recommendations? Anything specific that comes uh, to mind? Yeah, there, there's one that I listen to every day, and that's Just Shoot It. Just Shoot It. They should... Um, yeah, that, it's just... Uh, again, that's just direct... It's just two directors talking about how they kind of, how they navigate clients on set, how they navigate everything. And they're very honest about it, uh, stuff. And that, that's really good. Um, I'm trying to think of others. I'll, I'll, I'll have a sly look on my phone in a bit, um, seamlessly, but there's a couple of others that I listen to quite regularly. But yeah, Just Shoot It is it's one of my favorites because they just don't mind about saying how bad they were about things. I mean, they're real, they don't, there's no agenda to make them sound, sound good. Do you know what I mean? They're just yeah. real people. So, uh, yeah. Um, so, yeah, definitely learned a, lo a lot from that. Um, and, yeah, just talking to people. Like, that's one of my biggest things. I think I mentioned this before, but uh, just asking people how you got there. Uh, and, that, like, intrinsically, people are generally nice. And people generally like to talk about themselves. Uh, you know, so if you've got to sacrifice a little bit, like, stroking their ego slightly what you know do that but 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 ask questions people look people that are directing are generally kind of had to uh, are passionate about it and had to fight to get there um you know uh so yeah i would just ask people but yeah reading a room all of those things about kind of sensing it, it sensing how your suggestion to that actor has gone down as well but also not being afraid to stick to your point your vision because also, you can get watered down. So there's a balance between listening to people, but some things you might think are unmovable that are important in that scene or that particular beat, if that makes sense. Um, yeah. Okay, we've got, a, we've got a question about animation. Hopefully, I can we can tackle something else briefly before we get to that, just while we're on the topic. You mentioned being around, looking, and sort of just being a spectator, of, you know, for a across your years that really helped you learn to be a director and to go back to the point you were going to make earlier on how do you know when to say no 
to these opportunities because by the sounds of it you've learned from everything you've done and it's contributed to your success but obviously there is an issue in the industry with everyone sort of trying to use everyone to their own benefit and mm. not be very considerate so how do you manage to balance that then? so if i was someone starting out now yeah that, we're talking to them yeah um I guess one thing is like, so say it's some, an output or a channel or something that you really like. So, so it's Comedy Central, excuse me, or something like that, you know, where you like the output, it's worth just trying that, I think, and knowing it is what it is. And it may just be, you might just be a kind of stream of interns that go in and go out. Um, but, but I think if the, if the stuff that they're making is important enough to you, you've got to take that one on the chin and it's a thing for the CV and you know, you know, the game, you probably aren't going to get hired, but, but just be, have that awareness to be able to make that decision. I think, so i worked, when I came to Brighton initially, when we were setting up Big Egg, I was teaching uh, media and it's something I've done all the way through teaching. Um, and I love it because it makes me have to learn more because I won't go and talk to people if I don't know the ins and outs of it. So I, it's a real, yeah, I love teaching and, um, what was my point? Oh, no, he's crashed. He's crashed. Uh, I think, uh, uh, oh, God. Harry, help me here. Harry, I've forgotten it. Oh, well, only you know what you were going to say. Only, you to circle you, you back? Get, yeah. Ask the go question on. again. Is that what yeah, you want? Go on, go on, go on. We can rewind uh, this. The one for the outtakes. Yeah, just how do you find the balance between saying no to people yes. and valuing yourself? And yeah, so we were teaching. So that was the point. Yeah. And my old boss came down from Disney. And she, uh, she offered um, free internships to our learners, uh, free sessions, and uh, two of which just didn't take it, didn't take that opportunity. And I was trying to explain that that is like, I'd have died to have that opportunity. Like she was genuinely passionate about it. And I think, I think so maybe just do a bit of research on the placement and know if it's worth taking your time to do it. I mean, lots of people aren't in the situation where they can afford to do stuff you know I was lucky that I could work in a bar and cover myself like that but that might not be might you might not be in a place where you could do that or you might have uh, depend you might have a child I don't know so I was in a fortunate position to be able to be go and do that but yeah I think definitely research the position I think um, uh, I think when it becomes a problem you a lot of it you will feel um, I think I had the same people asked me back for the same thing all the time and it just didn't develop and I wasn't that inspired about the job um, and the people weren't that nice you know uh, I think make a connection so if you've got a connection with someone the one that I stuck at that person looked out for me I had a genuine connection with them and I genuinely wanted to learn I think I think if you know it's going to be for free when you feel like the learning is stopped just get out you know you've got that on the CV um, but there's also lots of dodgy stuff so just research stuff, you know, um, the one of the best ones I did was National Film and Television School, uh, NFTS. Um, yeah. Uh, and theirs was a work experience, but I learned so much. It's the first time I ever saw a camera that recorded with film and it was like, OK, this is serious. Um, uh, yeah. So that that that's good. I think. Yeah, I think I think you'll know. When I, I, I remember thinking, I know now this. I'm not getting anything else out of this. And now I'm I'm being essentially exploited. Um, you know, I, I, I remember being aware of that and just like, I don't want to do this anymore, if you know what I mean. Um, but yeah, I, it's a long winded. But now as a company, we still have this battle. So we'll be asked by charities or people doing things. Can you do this for cheap? Can you do this for free? And we've had to say now we do three campaigns a year, completely free. And we do 10 at half price. And we have to do that because we have to pay our insurance yeah, yeah we have to make sure that our staff are paid on time touch wood that's happened you know um so it's that's about survival and that i think once it's taken out of your hands it's a bit more of an easier thing and i think that's for me in terms of valuing myself as well but i used to go in so cheap when i quoted when i first started out but then when i had like other crew members i'm not, I'm not letting them go for 100 quid a day that's ridiculous so I kind of learned by what I charged then, 
differently. I just used to imagine what if I was doing it for someone else, what would I, what would I ask for them, if that makes sense? So that was my way forward with that. But yeah, I think you get a good feeling, do some research, definitely. Um, and it's got to light you up. There's got to be someone there inspires you or the works will inspire you. They're my things really um, that I would look out for. Definitely. Okay, fantastic. Yeah. Very helpful stuff there. Thank you. Now to go back to a question that Jamie asked in the chat and that's to do with animation and what type of animation do you use? Uh, what is our particular software? You know, your later projects, what have you, what have you done? So, so we're definitely not an experienced animation outhouse. I will put it that way. Um, but the animators that we, the animators that we work with are very experienced, but we're still, it's a new thing for us. So we started doing this last year. Um, so we're still kind of managing how that looks. Um, but in terms of software, we use After Effects. So most of the animation is done in After Effects. Uh, sometimes we use Blender, um, which is a really good free, and people are nodding, yeah, it's quite well known, isn't it? I think it's now bought by, Apple actually, but it's not, they're not going to mess it up, I've been told. So um, it's been acquired by Apple, I think, but but uh, not by Apple, it's been acquired by uh, da, 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 Premiere Pro, Adobe, Adobe, sorry. Um, but yeah, um, yeah, so so those are the two, two main ones um, that we specialize in. We do 2D and 3D animation. That's our kind of backbone. Obviously 2D, uh, yeah. And we've got artists that will create assets as well. Because na naively, when I started, I just assumed an animator draws or an animator creates assets, and that they don't, obviously. Um, so you know that we've got artists that will can do that now, which is really really good. But um, again, as I say, it's quite an early service that we mm -hmm. are doing. So I think the longest. I mean, also as well, the thing to think about is. Yeah, uh, the animators in the room will know this, but yeah, it's just, yeah, the, the need for the storyboard. I mean, normally in my world, everything is still, I would still say 80% pre-production. So shooting, a, uh, making something for someone with cameras, it's, you've got to have the planning in place, like, and the actual shoot is, should, you know, you, if you've done your pre-production, it should run smoothly. But animation is obviously even, feels like even more so pre-production, really planning, because when it's, when you've got an animator doing client amends, that's when it's getting getting expensive. Mm -hmm. You know, if I'm sat in Premiere or one of our editors sat in Premiere effect changing video clips, that's not as expensive. If you've got an animator, like obviously day rates are much higher. I mean, our animators start around 450 a day and go up to anything up to 700 pounds a day. So someone that has, yeah, we're working with someone at the moment, um, Sean Allen, she's incredible, but she's done loads of stuff like channel four stuff but um super quick as well but you know i need to before i even engage with her i need to make sure everything is so organized and everything mm -hmm. is you know that uh, we can't afford to not we can't literally we can't afford to mess about and not have stuff ready and prepared so um yeah and a follow-up there is just have you done anything with ar in your animation no no, no. but i would be really interested in that that's a future um, project then, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Re that does really interest me, yeah. Uh, but also the infinite, the possibilities blows my mind, if I'm really honest, as well. Uh, yeah, because when you go back, all of our stuff is based around story, narrative. So when you can give multiple narratives or go down different routes, yeah, it blows my mind. I've seen some things where you'll reach a point and then you can choose, you have the agency as the audience to decide do I get on that path? Do I get on that path? But um, yeah, I'd love to. I'd love to learn about that. But I also think that will blow my mind. Yeah, <laughs> it's slightly. Uh, another question from Laura in the chat. Could you tell us what the hey. difference is between <laughs> shooting a scripted uh, a scripted film and a dance piece? If you have any experience with that. Uh, what in in preparation or at the actual shooting? Sorry, Laura. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, All right. <laughs> uh, what I mean, like, you know, because I was thinking coming from theater uh, and I know like, you know, the setting is a completely different uh, uh, way of working compared to film. What is the challenge on, you know, in the team, in the way how you shoot in the way like, you know, because I, I can assume, imagine that when they do the performance dancers, they cannot really stop. 
I don't know if, he, if you use something like one shoot all the way long, the way how you decide what you see in the camera. And I don't know, it was interesting to understand uh, the dynamic. Yeah. I Thank you. Uh, and by the way, uh, yeah, I do know Laura. Uh, thank you. <laughs> we've met before <laughs> and we've done lots of work together. So that's the nice thing. But I, I think, <laughs> small world, uh, I, I think though, Laura, the same thing is, is approached really to shooting a film in the way that we would always, and we do this for acting as well, but we would always start, a, you plan to do your wides first, your wider shots first, work out the geography of the shot. And obviously with dance, I, I've learned, yeah, I should have known this, but I learned, obviously it's choreographed straight forward very often. And I, one shoot we did a, a six months ago, so I'm still learning. Uh, we had a crane shot that was, I loved. I was like, yeah, we need to do that. And it was going out on the barbecue and I was well excited. And it was tracking down the sides of the actors. And we had a tracking dolly that was going up and down and looked beautiful. And the lights were bouncing off and lovely. And yeah, the, uh, the, the, we couldn't use any of it it wasn't shot front on it wasn't how it was choreographed to be so that was we were filming in a dance event it wasn't dance for film and that's the fundamental difference if that makes sense but but certainly if we approach a scene i think this is a good tip for anyone shooting anything is to watch the wides start with the wides get a feel of the action get a feel of what happens and then kind of decide even if you've storyboard the hell out of it you still don't know, like, I think something like a set is almost like having a location is like a third character in my mind. It changes everything. I don't need to tell you about that, or I know that's what you specialize in art direction and that, but, but that changes everything. So something you've planned on paper, don't just say, well, I'm going to stick to it because I've paid a storyboard artist to draw it, or I spent ages drawing that. Um, so yeah, I think definitely it's about geography, start wide, feel the scene, feel the motion, um, and then do your mids and then get them and do your closes if, if you've got the luxury to, to work like that. Um, obviously, a lots of TV stuff, if it's getting churned out quickly, they'll be shooting like that. So they'll be doing two cameras working at the same time. With dance as well, I would always get more than one camera going. You know, I would try and play with that slightly. Um, the danger of dance is that, and anything really, any camera movement, I think, uh, we go, oh, I've got a dolly, so I must use it. I'm going to whip up and whip down all the time throughout this whole scene. But I think one thing someone taught me is that if it doesn't serve the piece, then just get rid of it. You know, you don't need to move for movement's sake. It's got to serve the feel of the piece. And I guess you've got the performance and you've got the camera and you've got the camera movement. And the, the film happens in between those three. Uh, like, you know, for example, if you're hiding behind a you know you're doing a pov shot then that person feels like they're vulnerable and they're being followed it's that relationship between those things that that's key and again you don't know until you try it we used to do so much muck around like videos at uni and stuff and like most people we just thought it was funny it probably wasn't but at the time we thought it was but but actually that kind of just messing around and doing like, that's why i like that just shoot it podcast it's like stop finding 101 reasons to not do something procrastinate later like just get out and do that bit and die on your ass but you'll learn loads from it so i think that's one thing that i've been lucky to have people around me and that's another point um that have kind of lifted me up or laughed at rubbish jokes or i've laughed at their rubbish jokes but it's sort of also being aware who your company is because i've also worked with people that I've kind of taken the wind out myself a little bit and not to say that I don't deserve it at times, but like think about carefully who you work with. That's one thing I would definitely say, you know, you want to people that lift you up, you know, because if you're anything like me, I'm already doubting everything and thinking I shouldn't do it. I don't need something else to kind of reinforce that, you know, I need to be challenged. I'm not saying that and I'm not saying I'm precious and but, um, but yeah, yeah. Think about who you who you're with, and yeah. Uh, sorry, God, I went off one there, didn't I? No, that's fine. That's that's what. Tell you about my shopping in a minute. Sorry. <laughs> But yeah, I'm sure that's something that resonates with anyone in the creative field. Is you do need to surround yourself with people that motivate you because otherwise it's constant self doubt, and having the team behind you is what will get you far. So, and especially yeah. now, just to jump in, Harry, that you know, in the podcast I'm listening to, like it's not just everyone you know everyone is suffering with mental health at the moment mm -hmm. and in this time and i'm hearing on the podcast like top directors are doubting themselves 
you know there's that moment of uh, oh, I've got to go back to work and I don't am I you know everyone's feeling that anxiousness everyone's feeling that so if that's any relief to anyone like we're all in the same boat people some people don't admit it but it's true and I think that's really important to remember that we are working against the wind at the moment but it's having that self-belief and just going do you know what I can do it and then what's the worst if I fall over and you know just get back up and you've learned more you know that's that's how I think it's important okay well to piggyback off of that just briefly before we sort of go into uh who pays you I wanted to ask <laughs> how is it that you how do you go about networking with people in your industry then how do you find those people so I've got two parts of the business and one part isn't developed enough yet. And that is our own writing. That's the thing that gets me really excited. Uh, but the same techniques are put into our client stuff. Um, but yeah, how do we get that work? So networking. So there's some really kind of formal things like the Brighton Chamber, which I can't, you know, most people would think of that as white men in grey suits over 60 with loads of money and, you know, secret handshakes. But Brighton is Brighton is really good for this. Um, and there's parts of London I know, you know, so so for me, like when we first started, we got 80 to 90 percent of our work from Brighton Chamber. So that's just going around, oh, wow. handing out cards, and just chatting with people, you know. Um, but I mean, I've, one thing I would say is like, so say you want to be a photographer, for example, or um, find out where the people so maybe have an imaginary thing we did some work with someone that helped us think about who our audience is so who's big eggs audience who is our ideal audience where do they hang out in person where do they hang out online you know and that kind of helped us narrow it down a little bit but um there's also some really good things like um yeah uh so if you're trying to find people to work with perhaps you're talking about money though, aren't you, Harry? Where do I get my paid work from? Oh, uh, well, I just specifically or that was sort of where I wanted this to end yeah. up. But I just meant more maybe finding people within your industry that you could sort of work with and rely on. Um, and you mentioned earlier on as well, uh, websites. I think those were to find work, but if you've got any websites as well to sort of do Yeah, so so careful when you type this in, but shooting people uh, is a really good website. Um, Mandy.com, there's talent circle. There's, there's people that are asking for free crew and things like that. There's Brighton Facebook Filmmakers Group, um, which is really, really good. They've got some really good admins, so they're quite, like, good at people that, yeah, that sometimes some of these groups can get carried away with themselves or whatever, but the admin on that team are really good, uh, really responsible. Um, and they're, yeah, National Film and Television School. So, mm -hmm. so things like mandy.com, creative uh circle uh, ta talent circle and shooting people they will have posts from i found a post from there from nfts national film and television school and that's where i kind of went for that uh job uh, um as a runner um so so they're like really good but again just ask people that maybe you know f to, to find someone that's sort of five years ahead of you it's just gold dust. If you can make a connection with them, I mean, I'm not so good at kind of sitting down and reading loads and learning like that. I like hearing it in my ear from a podcast or I like going and talking to people. I learn, and I don't know, I do read, I'm not copping out of that, but I do, but I genuinely like fi finding someone that's five years ahead of, of me in my career was just so beneficial. And just kind of that, yeah, that resource is just you know amazing someone who's already done those things before you but yeah in brighton there yeah, there's filmmaker groups there's loads on facebook but definitely brighton facebook uh, uh filmmakers i think it's called let me just find out if i can send you any links harry as well um just to double check i've got that one right but i think it is um but yeah that that was that that was a good thing and then you know the other thing as well as um just chatting with people uh just in the street and we got work when we first started with ba we just got the phone book up rang loads of companies in brighton uh and just said look this is what we're doing we're starting out um, um and the second day no it wasn't it was the third day of doing it for seven days we got a job with the council uh i mean it wasn't the most well paid job but it was good and but but just by ringing around i know like a phone a phone call a cold call probably feels a bit cringe but it it was just the right time the right place and, and the other thing as well as linkedin i really do think i mean a lot of our clients are business b2b so business to business 
So having a good LinkedIn page, but now like also Instagram, like most people will, we know now lots of people will go to our Instagram before our website. Mm -hmm. And I guess it's just a security blanket for them. Like if they've heard about us or we've been recommended to them, they'll go to our Instagram and go, yeah, uh, or no, but it's, it's just that they should have an Instagram you know following so we, we put a lot of stuff up there and you know visual mediums lend themselves to the way that instagram is set up um so you know that's another place to engage with people as well i think if you see some work on there that you really like talk to people on online you know talk to people dm them say like look you know people generally like to talk about it and people generally like to share how they got somewhere you know most um, people will have been in the position that you're currently in essentially so yeah i'll be more empathetic to helping you out yeah and also like if you don't have a company that you you know one thing i did was i just didn't find a company that really lit me up so i had to do something myself that was where i got to but but don't you know i love it when i see people coming out of college and setting their own thing up why not you're going to learn loads from that you know Mm -hmm. and yeah i i really think that's that you have to learn quickly but yeah, it's a really good experience, you know, um, to do that. It's quite liberating, I think. Um, so, yeah, if, if it's not there, build it, I think. Fantastic. Okay, how do you earn a living from what you do? Who is it that pays you? So, um, so companies will pay us. So, um, so for example, there was lots of, I don't know if you remember on the show reel, there was a, a company called Freckle. So there's Zog, there was a puppet of Zog. So, for example, for them, Actually, going back to getting work, website. So we got a cold call from them. I'm sure they won't mind me sharing this with you. So we wrote blogs. We write a blog every week on our website to keep our SEO up, uh, search engine optimization. So we're up. And they searched us, organically found video production, Brighton, and they cold called us. And that's happening more and more for us now because we've been working on our website. Um, So then they called us. uh, they've got to get a trailer or free trailers every year for their new shows for kids. It's all Julia Donaldson kind of stuff. So it's quite fun to do. Um, and yeah, so they, th- we then sit down and work out a contract. So basically as big, Ed, we, we ask a series of questions. It's always the same. It's always about audience who is, and that's what work for photography, I would imagine, or who are the, who is that company talking to? Who, who do they want to reach for them? It was mums and kids, you know, uh then once we've got that we then come away and we make a quote and we send them back a quote um based on yeah i'm not gonna get too deep into this but based on the value it's added so we charge people different rates which some people feel a bit weird about so we would charge a charity much less than we charge a big corporate because that big corporate will be able to make more money as, as a result of the video we've made them so we we, we it's value based costing is how we work you know um and so yeah so what i would do then is i would say okay we need four crew members we need a sound lady a cameraman a camera lady and we need you know something else hotel work that out work out what the day rates are and as a company we add a bit more on so we'll add like one third onto their day rates or something like that i'm getting too deep am i getting too granular I think that's all right. Yeah, you, <laughs> yeah. No, keep going if you've got more to say. Yeah. yeah, but 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 so we have a rough idea that that's where we are, you know, um, in terms of costs, and then we'll chat with them about it. But even now, I go oh, if I, once I put that quote in, you never know. You never really know that uh, you know. I might check out company's house because anyone could check out our company's house, work out how much we turned over last year. So that's mm-hmm. a good way to search as well. Like how much are they actually turning over? um so that we can base our quote on that um but yeah so so then we agree a contract with them and what's really important is that we ask for them to pay 50 percent up front because we nearly went bust uh one of our first jobs we got with sony it's for 10 grand and um we had to hire a studio blah blah blah, blah. and i didn't know I didn't realize that it's quite common practice for someone once you've delivered the job to then wait 30 days with your invoice before you get paid so we, yeah I had to get a credit card out I ended up like three grand in debt I had to borrow three grand for the 10 grand job and then we made seven grand profit so it was just like yeah so definitely get a contract 
and you, we just our first contract we just ripped it off the internet like open source contract and it's it was good it was fine you know it covered us um and we put our, our payment details in and we want 50 percent up front upon signing the contract we want 50 percent upon delivery upon sign off um we're really clear on how many rounds of changes the client was allowed because that can just go on and on and on well i think we've changed the put another filter on it yeah that's what we had before but yeah um so so yeah just be really clear about that and if you're freelance this is something i didn't you're going to get to this aren't you is it now to talk about that yeah i was going to say uh, are there any like resources you can recommend for people that are doing this as well uh i can send uh an invoice uh to you a copy uh, a copy of an invoice and a copy of a contract if you want i'm happy yeah. to do that and um, we can Fantastic. make that yeah um so yeah yeah i'll definitely do that but i mean in all honesty i just googled it and just got a video production template a video production contract or photographer contract um but yeah with with being a freelancer as well it's sort of you just need that in place and actually i think the client feels safer as well if you're doing that because they just know you've thought about it and you know um also you know if you're a freelancer you can get away with not registering but it's dodgy i would register if you're a freelancer i would contact hmrc and say i am now self-employed um but with that comes some legal obligations so once a year you'll need to you will need to submit your tax return online i think it is now i think you can only do it online now um and you'll need to keep your receipts as you go so anything work related and don't try and do anything else because you won't get away with it. You know, uh, I need this haircut for work or yeah, yeah, um, this computer game. Uh, but yeah, so you can claim back all of those expenses. So it's keep, keep that. Um, yeah, and just keep a record of your finances. Like I just have a Dropbox folder because I'm not a very organized person. So I'll do it straight away and then I'll know it's in, in place. But yeah, contract, invoice um, and yeah, register with, with HMRC. Um, the standard thing though is, I mean, for example, Big Egg, we've got some Pete staff that are PAYE. So, so they are on our books, so they don't need to be. So say you were working in a shop or you work in a McDonald's, you would be PAYE. So um, they don't necessarily, they don't need to register as self-employed, but occasionally you will be asked to do that. But um, most big companies, so in Brighton, there's what there's Ricochet. Uh, would really recommend trying to get some work experience for those guys. They've got a good, a really good, uh, again, you, the chances of you getting employed are minimal you know but uh, and you just being on but it's just good to know work out know what you're going to take from it you're working in a big machine do you know what i mean so you'll be churned around and there'll be the next people in but if you're just like soaking it all up just get a feel of these things i don't you might come out and go i never want to work in a company like that again but you know um but yeah so stuff like that but if you're working with them full time you'd probably be paye you know be on the books i should imagine but um, but some of our the, like our animators they don't want to be on big eggs books because they want to work for other companies as well. We wouldn't have you know so yeah that's the difference between freelancer and um, PAYE. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, so what what else did we say? Yeah, uh, contract invoice. Uh, yeah, and don't just assume that you understand that you know another thing that's really helped me with a job is that within that question we send them, well, who's the audience? Who are we talking to? I always ask references. So I say, if you've got a video that you that you like, or can you show me a picture? Like, because to be able to communicate tone is really hard as well. So those sorts of things are really important. Yeah, I've talked too long, haven't I? No, it's fine. Um, okay, well, we'll start wrapping up now. If anyone has any final questions, then we'll be gladly, uh, we'll gladly take them. Um, and I suppose if there isn't any questions, just any parting, you know, words of wisdom, any tips, survival tips for anyone that you think is really crucial. I know you've touched again on just being very friendly and one thing I would say is, um, yeah, yeah, I would say find your voice and don't be afraid if you're a bit of a weirdo. I know that sounds strange, but like my kind of thoughts are I'm a people I'm often like a people pleaser. Or I'll often change things and water them down. But if it's a creative thing, just be like, don't feel like you've got to fit in. If you go with it, because actually 
people want that. People don't want someone who's doing the same stuff as everyone else. Like nurture that bit in you. I wasn't confident enough. I'm learning now. But nurture that bit that's weird about you or that bit that's, uh, you know, in your in your art. And be, don't be afraid to, to, to follow that. Um, and also remember where you're from, your roots, because those things will come through in your work anyway. So it's good to just have an awareness of that. Like where are you from? What matters to you? Do you know what I mean? I think that stuff influences in people's work without them even realising. But if you're aware of that, you can play with that, if you know what I mean, as a concept. But yeah, definitely. And be around people that, that be, I know we've already said that, but yeah. Um, and connections is everything. Just have a chat with people. People like working with passionate people, I think. So yeah, uh, yeah. Make sure it's, make sure you still find everything exciting, I would think. And if not, become an accountant, <laughs> I would say. impression <laughs> yeah well that's that's fantastic I'll, I'll take note of that and uh <laughs> again thank you so much a lot of gems in there uh, thank you harry you've strung yeah. together <laughs> yeah. i attempted to yeah and don't apologize i mean you're the expert here that's we want to hear all the rambling it's, it's very helpful stuff so uh again thanks for your time that, that was very informative and thanks anyone else that uh that participated and uh gave us some questions <laughs>